In 2011, the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity, a U.S. government organization, launched a four-year prediction tournament. Five research teams competed by trying to answer extremely complex and specific questions, ranging from international politics to economics. What is the chance that a member will withdraw from the European Union by a target date? Would the Japanese stock market close above 9,500 points? What is the likelihood of a naval clash claiming more than 10 lives in the East China Sea? Four of those teams were composed of highly educated experts, with more than 12 years of experience in their fields. They were hyper-specialists, who spent their entire lives studying just one or two problems. But one of the teams, called the Good Judgment Project, went in a different direction. This was a team led by Philip Tetlock a psychologist and political scientist who spearheaded a 20-year study about the science behind making accurate predictions. This study that inspired this very tournament. Instead of using hyperspecialists, Tetlock gathered a variety of volunteers. They were just bright people with wide-ranging interests and reading habits, but with no relevant background. And during the four years of competition, this group of ordinary people consistently outperformed the teams of narrow-focused hyper-specialists. The Good Judgment Project performed about 30% better than experienced intelligence community analysts with access to classified data. This group was able to make more accurate predictions because its members didn't have a narrow focus in just a single domain. Instead, they had a breadth of knowledge. They had range. And range is at the heart of Dr. Stone. Dr. Stone is a manga written by Riichiro Inagaki and drawn by Boichi, and it tells the story of humanity trying to rebuild modern civilization after a mysterious catastrophe erases two million years of human progress. On a day like any other, a flash of light ignites the skies around the world, turning every single human on the planet into stone statues. Free from human intervention, nature is able to once again take over the planet, giving birth to the stone world. Little to no remains of human civilization are left standing. But that is about to change, because after 3,000 years, one human awakens. The first person to break away from their stone prison was able to do so because they managed to stay conscious for thousands of years, diligently counting every single second, biding their time, keeping track of the passing years, waiting for an opportunity to rise again. This is Senku, a high schooler who is insanely passionate about science. Senku is determined to use the power of science to not only figure out the mystery behind the petrification event, but also to bring back all of humanity. However, Senku alone is very limited in what he can do, so he'll need to gather allies, allies who have skills and knowledge that he does not, in order to build the kingdom of science, so that together they can revive our scientific civilization. But besides the challenges of figuring out how the world ended up like this and rebuilding modern society from scratch in this hostile stone world, Senku will also have to deal with other humans who are not on board with his plan. People who are not interested in bringing back all of humanity. People like Tsukasa Shishio, the strongest high schooler. Tsukasa thinks that reviving all of humanity in our scientific civilization is a big mistake. Doing so would simply bring back all the failures of modern society and destroy this innocent stone world. Tsukasa believes they should narrow their choices. The best way forward is to bring back only the most capable, strongest and pure-hearted people according to their vision, keeping science at bay by limiting which scientific achievements to bring back to. Also, they can build a better and more prosperous future. But Senku will not back down for he has a different vision for the future, a vision shaped by his belief in science. And this future can only come to be with the power of every single human on Earth. So Senku will have to face Tsukasa's kingdom of the strongest by creating his kingdom of science, using cooperation and diligent hard work to bring back technology from scratch to level the battlefield. But why is Senku so fixated on this idea? Why is he willing to risk his own life in order to make his vision of the future a reality. That's because Senku understands the true power of science and humanity. Senku understands the power of range. In this video, we're gonna find out why Senku's goal may really be the best option 
for building a brighter and more prosperous future, using the book range by David Epstein and Dr. Son's story to understand why science, diversity, and collaboration are humanity's greatest powers. This young child is Senko, determined to go to space he figured out that the fastest way to make that happen would be to build his very own rocket. So to make his dream come true, Senku started to research and study everything about science. It seems like Senku is on the path of becoming another great example for the cult of the head start. The very popular assumption that to become truly great at something, you should start early, stay focused, and never deviate from your goal. So I'd like to talk about the development of human potential, and I'd like to start with maybe the most impactful modern story of development. Many of you here have probably heard of the 10,000 hours rule. Maybe you even model your own life after it. Basically, it's the idea that to become great in anything takes 10,000 hours of focused practice, so you'd better get started as early as possible. The poster child for this story is Tiger Woods. His father famously gave him a putter when he was seven months old, at 10 months, he started imitating his father's swing. At two, you can go on YouTube and see him on national television. Fast forward to the age of 21, he's the greatest golfer in the world. It's quintessential 10,000 hours story. Another that features in a number of best-selling books is that of the three Polger sisters, whose father decided to teach them chess in a very technical manner from a very early age. And really, he wanted to show that with a head start and focused practice, any child could become a genius in anything. And in fact, two of his daughters went on to become grandmaster chess players. This is David Epstein, the writer of Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Wanting to discover if this idea of early hyperspecialization was indeed the norm, Epstein researched and interviewed the world's most successful athletes, artists, musicians, inventors, forecasters, and scientists. The Tiger Woods and Poger Sister stories being just a few of the many cases he presents throughout his book. And what he discovered is that the vast majority of these highly successful people hadn't actually gone deep and narrow into their fields from an early age. They didn't dedicate years of study and practice to a single domain in order to become an early specialist. It was, in fact, quite the opposite. So this got me interested, seeing this pattern again in exploring the developmental backgrounds of people whose work I had long admired. Like Duke Ellington, who shunned music lessons as a kid to focus on baseball and painting and drawing or Mariam Mirzakhani, who wasn't interested in math as a girl, dreamed of becoming a novelist, and went on to become the first and so far only woman to win the Fields Medal, the most prestigious prize in the world in math. Vincent van Gogh had five different careers, each of which he deemed his true calling, before flaming out spectacularly, and in his late 20s picked up a book called The Guide to the ABCs of Drawing. That worked out okay. Claude Shannon was an electrical engineer at the University of Michigan who took a philosophy course just to fulfill a requirement. And in it, he learned about a near-century-old system of logic by which true and false statements could be coded as ones and zeros and solved like math problems. This led to the development of binary code, which underlies all of our digital computers today. Finally, my own sort of role model, Frances Hesselbein, this is me with her. She took her first professional job at the age of 54, and went on to become the CEO of the Girl Scouts, which she saved. She tripled minority membership, added 130,000 volunteers, and this is one of the proficiency badges that came out of her tenure. It's binary code for girls learning about computers. People who go through a sampling period where they flirt with a variety of interests for years and only later in life settle down to focus on a specific domain are the ones who end up becoming the most influential and highly regarded specialists of their fields. Having access to diverse experiences and interests is exactly what allows these people to see things from an angle that narrow-focused hyper-specialists cannot. This broader view leads them to insights that cannot be accessed by a single area of knowledge alone. And this is the power of range. Range gives people tools that help them evade one of the most dangerous traps any specialist is prone to fall into. Cognitive entrenchment. Cognitive entrenchment may happen when a specialist faces a situation or problem that changes the fundamental rules of his work. In range, Dave Epstein talks about some studies about this phenomenon. Quote, In research in the game of bridge, where the order of play was altered, experts had a more difficult time adapting to new rules than non-experts did. When experienced accountants were asked in a study to use a new tax law that replaced a previous one, they did worse than novices. 
cognitive entrenchment makes specialists stick to their usual tools, not knowing how to adapt them to a new scenario. Some people even end up becoming more rigid, doubling down their past experiences and prior knowledge, even when they're proven wrong, and it's very clear they should reassess the situation and look for a different approach. All of this because they get used to dealing with a kind learning environment. Golf is the epitome of what the psychologist Robin Hogarth called a kind learning environment. Kind learning environments have next steps and goals that are clear, rules that are clear and never change. When you do something, you get feedback that is quick and accurate. Work next year will look like work last year. Chess, also a kind learning environment. The Grandmaster's advantage is largely based on knowledge of recurring patterns, which is also why it's so easy to automate. So while at first it may seem like Senku would fall into the early specialist category of Tiger Woods and the Poser Sisters, the biggest difference is that he didn't develop his skills in a kind learning environment. Senku wanted to build a rocket by himself from scratch, so he had to deal with countless problems he had never come across before. He was thrown into and forced to deal with a wicked learning environment. On the other end of the spectrum are wicked learning environments, where next steps and goals may not be clear. Rules may change. You may or may not get feedback when you do something. It may be delayed, it may be inaccurate, and work next year may not look like work last year. So which one of these sounds like the world we're increasingly living in? Senko's eagerness to reach his goal didn't allow him to go narrow and deep. To solve wicked world problems, Senko had to work across the full range of science, making him develop one of the most powerful tools that people with range have access to. He learned how to think like an integrator to solve problems. Senko's task involved a lot of specific scientific knowledge that he didn't have. He had to understand concepts from chemistry, physics, biology, math, engineering, geology, astronomy, and more. To conquer these challenges, he learned to first understand exactly the problem he's facing, by figuring out the fundamental questions he should be asking, to then look for answers to these questions within the different branches of science to be able to make connections and integrate all this information to come up with ideas to solve his original problem. Working in such a wicked learning environment prepared Senko to deal with constant uncertainty and ambiguity when facing problems, and by being able to move forward through sheer steady, earnest, painstaking trial and error work while following science's core principles, Senko learned firsthand how science can be used as a tool to solve any problem and answer any question. A tool that anyone can use, since science was created to make the most out of the greatest power every single human has. Diligence. So when Senku breaks free from his stone prison after 3,000 years, in his face with the stone world, the most wicked problem humanity has ever faced, he doesn't even flinch. Because his past experiences didn't teach him a mechanical step-by-step -step process on how to make a rocket. They taught him the scientific method. No matter if the problem at hand is something as simple as building a fire, or as insane as figuring out how to break humans free from some mysterious petrification brought by an unprecedented scientific phenomenon, the process remains the same. Through careful and skeptical observation, you formulate a hypothesis, and through rigorous testing, try to search for rules and principles behind the inexplicable, analyzing results and using this information to refine your hypothesis, over and over again. This, in a nutshell, is science. So Senko deals with every single challenge that comes his way by breaking a larger goal into smaller steps, while following science's core principles. And through diligent experimentation, coupled with trial and error work, he learns from his mistakes, and slowly inches closer towards the end goal. Senko's range of knowledge in science and his experience in dealing with a wicked learning environment allow him to integrate different ideas and concepts to deal with many situations. But after a lot of diligent work to secure food, clothing, and shelter, Senko collapses. Range coupled with an integrator way of thinking is not an omnicompetent tool, since there's a limit to how far a single person's range can go. As a child, Senko was only able to progress as much as he did because he was not alone. He was helped by many people who could do what he couldn't, and who knew things that he didn't. 
This collaborative process is what allowed Senku to progress much further, much faster than he could ever hope by himself. Just like science itself was only able to progress so much because he had access to the biggest pool of range that ever existed, humanity's 2 million years of knowledge. Former MIT Dean Vannevar Bush believed so too. In 1945, he wrote a report titled Science, the Endless Frontier, which led to the creation of the National Science Foundation, responsible for many scientific discoveries such as the Doppler radar, fiber optics, web browsers, and the MRI. In his report, he explained the essence of successful innovation culture. Quote, Scientific process on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects, working on subjects of their own choice in the manner dictated by their curiosity for exploration of the unknown. Thanks to science, people's knowledge and passions that were polished through diligent effort don't have to die with them. They can be passed on to the next generation. They can continue working from where they left off. This accumulation of knowledge allows people to work together across centuries. And in doing so, science keeps growing and evolving. Progress always giving way to further progress. That's why science is at its most powerful when it has access to range. If we look at research on technological innovation, it shows that increasingly the most impactful patents are not authored by individuals who drill deeper, deeper, deeper into one area of technology, as classified by the US Patent Office, but rather by teams that include individuals who have worked across a large number of different technology classes and often merge things from different domains. This idea becomes even more clear when we look at something like the Innocentive Group. This project connects companies and research labs to a wide net of everyday people, transforming problems that torment these institutions into interesting challenges that anyone can try to solve. Simply throwing a problem at an extremely large group of people, from different backgrounds and countries, with expertise from a variety of domains, makes it possible to find solutions far outside the realm of the problem itself. A range this big is powerful enough to solve an issue that stumped NASA specialists for 30 years in just six months. It turns out that when faced with situations with no clear answers and going where no one has gone to before, wicked road problems like the stone world, working with the biggest range possible is not only an advantage, but a necessity. The wider the range, the bigger are the chances for success. And that's the compass that guides Dr. Stone's story. Use science together with range to solve problems. And this usually boils down to Senku and the Kingdom of Science using their range to build scientific tools that can help them reach their goals. The first step always being the creation of a roadmap. The more complex and absurd the invention seems, the crazier and bigger the roadmap is. Whenever Senko reviews what they're going to craft next, the characters and readers always have the same reaction. But one of the most interesting aspects about this story is that everything the Kingdom of Science ends up doing is backed up by actual real-life science. The writer Irichiro Nagaki is a person of range. His many interests and curiosity allow him to create stories in a variety of genres, from the coming-of-age sports manga about American football, I Shoot 21, to Trillion Game, a manga about psychological battles in the corporate world, and also the post-apocalyptic science-based Dr. Stone. So when Inagaki decided to create a comic about science, he and the artist Boichi did a lot of research to craft their manga, always citing their sources on each of the series volumes. They also collaborate with science consultants to make sure that the solutions and inventions the characters come up with throughout the story are as scientifically accurate as possible. Be them swords, electricity, antibiotics, a car, a drone, cell phones, a GPS, a computer, and more. Nothing is impossible for Senko and his allies when they work together following science's core principles. The characters will gather resources and look for allies with specific skill sets to craft the necessary parts to finish their invention. And slowly, the seemingly impossible scientific achievement becomes a reality, through a lot of trial and error hard work. All of this leading to a big confrontation against an opposing faction where the Kingdom of Science must overcome gigantic challenges using the powers of science and range. But for Senko to be able to reach his final goal of bringing back all of humanity and solve the mystery behind the petrification event, 
he needs to deal with increasingly bigger challenges and craft exponentially complex tools. So the kingdom of science needs the help of an ever-growing number of people. And the way Senku is able to gather allies is by making them go through the same process he went through as a child. Senku shows people the amazing things that can be accomplished with science, diligence, and cooperation. Science together with humanity's two million years of diligence and curiosity allowed humans to conquer the darkness of the night, to create scientific eyes that can make anyone see clearly, to defeat apparently incurable diseases, to produce delicious food, to turn the air itself into a conduit that connects people across any distance, and even to hear the voices of humans who are no longer with us. So the characters begin to wonder how far they could go if they expanded their range by working together with all of humanity, and they start wanting to turn Senko's vision of a future full of science into a reality. Not only do more people make it possible to create bigger and more complex inventions through human power and specific skills that only certain people have, but also more individuals with diverse experiences and perspectives make it easier to solve problems that even the brightest people alone couldn't solve. This is proven throughout the story whenever Senko gets stuck with a problem that he does not know how to solve. Sometimes, cognitive entrenchment makes Senko unable to realize a very simple thing. Cognitive entrenchment may even make Senko attempt to go after a very dangerous resource by himself. But whenever that happens, other people always remind Senko about the power of range. When his range alone is not enough to figure out a solution, he expands it by working with different types of people, and they together are able to integrate their unique ideas, experiences, and talents to come up with a solution. Still, the sheer scale of the problem the Kingdom of Science is trying to solve is sometimes able to back them against the wall, pitting them against overwhelming odds in the form of insane crafting challenges or overpowered opponents. But their faith in each other, shaped by their diligent hard work and belief in science, belief in the same core principles that brought them up to this point, is also what makes them keep moving forward. Everyone will just continue to chip away at the problem, integrating their unique skills until the very end, because they know that even if they die, all their effort will not die with them, because science is something that transcends their very lives. The kingdom of science is able to conquer any challenge because the essence of science is always true and it speaks to the greatest powers of humanity, diligence and diversity. On the other hand, the antagonists of Dr. Stone see the Stone World problem as a situation with a clear solution. The world from before was flawed and unsustainable. To bring everyone back would simply put us back to where we were before. So by reviving only the right people and creating boundaries on science, the world will be a better place. The people who oppose Senko are full of certainty about their ideas. They are sure there's only one way. You're either with them or against them. This conflict between the Kingdom of Science and the Tsukasa Kingdom is very similar to the forecasting competition between narrow hyper-specialists and bright people with wide-ranging interests 
that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It turns out that predicting future global events and figuring out how to rebuild human society after an unprecedented catastrophe are actually situations full of unknown factors. The definition of a wicked world problem. While the Kingdom of Science and the Good Judgment Project tackle such problems with range and cooperation, their rivals chose to deal with such complexity and randomness by limiting their reign, looking at these problems just from the lenses of their personal experiences, trying to force deterministic cause and effect rules to fit the problem to their personal bias. The hyperspecialists in the Tsukasa Kingdom end up becoming extremely sure of themselves, so that set about their ideas and knowledge that they cannot see beyond their biases. Their limited range keeps them stuck in cognitive entrenchment, as they try to force a kind learning environment approach to wicked world problems. We can see this happening when Hyoga, Tsukasa's right-hand man, during a confrontation with Senku, criticizes his naive idea of resurrecting all of humanity, stating with absolute certainty that the purification event was meant to thin humanity's numbers, for we had reached a breaking point. The Earth cannot sustain over 7 billion people. And Senko's response to such statements sums up the true power of humanity, science, and range. Senko knows that a problem as massive as saving humanity and the planet is definitely not a kind world problem, but a truly wicked one. There is no way to know for sure how to fix things, what will be enough, what will work or won't. The only thing that Senko has absolute faith in is that to solve such complex problems, we need science. And science is at its strongest when it has access to range. And range is one of the greatest strengths of humanity. <laughs> Our diversity of skills, backgrounds, and points of view presents us with unimaginable possibilities, an infinite pool of knowledge that can be integrated to help us solve any problem. That's how a group of ordinary people was able to make better predictions than teams made of only hyper-specialists. And that's why Senku wants to revive every single human on Earth. Humanity could probably survive if we only brought back a few people and created limits for science. But Senko doesn't want humanity to just survive, and neither does he want to simply bring the same world of the past back. Senko wants humanity to thrive, and he wants to create the world of the future. He wants science and humanity to keep moving forward to a future full of yet unimaginable scientific breakthroughs that allows us to conquer gigantic challenges. This is the type of world that excites Senku the most. And for that to happen, Senku is absolutely sure we need everyone. Even people who do not agree with him. Since the bigger the range, the farther we can go. Dave Dapstein at the end of his book wrote, The question I set out to explore was how to capture and cultivate the power of breath, diverse experience, and interdisciplinary exploration within systems that increasingly demand hyper-specialization and would have you decide what you should be before first figuring out who you are. In a way, Dr. Stone illustrates a possible answer to this question. Senko sees the stone world as an opportunity for all of humanity to truly understand the power of science, and experience firsthand how much we can achieve when we really work together. An opportunity to create a society where everyone understands that what makes us unique makes us better where people's diversity is seen as the most powerful and greatest asset possible. A society where following your passion and curiosity is never a waste, because it knows that's how science progresses. The Kingdom of Science is a world where we unlock humanity's full potential by capturing the unlimited power of our reign. A world where every single human on Earth works together to solve whatever comes our way. Such an uplifting and inspiring story could only be told by people who share Dave Epstein's vision of range. People who truly believe in humanity's greatest achievement. And in what makes humanity truly great. So I'll let Dr. Stone's artist Poichi speak for himself. I recently realized that in an era of human crisis, when we must believe in the power of science, 
Dr. Stone is an allegory about people saving humanity. Senku never submits despite facing countless desperate situations. He's a character who keeps going and smiling, staying true to himself while striving to use science and reason to protect humanity. I'm grateful to Inagaki Sensei for entrusting me with this series. I'll continue to work hard to portray the noble human spirit embodied by this story. No matter how long and difficult the scientific roadmap is, I know that humanity, like Senko, is going to triumph, no matter what obstacles lie ahead. Hello! Thank you so much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Dr. Stone is one of my favorite manga, and I've always wanted to make a video about it, but I never knew exactly how to approach this video. That was until I started reading Range by Dave Dempsey, and in the very first chapter, a phrase just popped into my head. Senko understands the power of Range. And the more I read the book, the more interesting connections I found between it and Dr. Stone. So there was so much more I wanted to talk about in the video, but it turned out way longer than I expected. This was by far the most challenging video I made so far, but I hope I got you interested in checking out Range and Dr. Stone. As always, links for everything that I talk about in the video are in the description. And if you're still watching this, please consider subscribing to the channel, because if you like this video, you're not gonna wanna miss next month's video, where I'm gonna talk about the most bizarre and unpredictable HBO show that you've probably never seen. See you next month.